Well, if you're new to church and uh, you're not sure what Easter is all about, you're not alone. Only 42% of people who will attend Easter Sunday services actually understand what the meaning of Easter is. For many people, Easter is just something fun to do with the kids that involves jelly beans and, and an Easter bunny. But the real message of Easter is not found in a bunny suit. It's not found in a basket full of marshmallow peeps. The real meaning of Easter is found in the Bible, in the Word of God. This is what declares the truth of Easter, that 2,000 years ago, God stepped into our world in the person of Jesus Christ. He died on a cross, was buried in a tomb, guarded by Roman soldiers, but on the third day, death could not keep him. The grave could not hold him. The Roman army could not stop him. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Now listen, no other religion can make this claim. There are 4,200 religions in the world, but only one empty tomb. Only one. You know what? We don't hear about the empty tomb of Muhammad. We don't hear about the empty tomb of Buddha or the empty tomb of Confucius. And there's a reason why. Because those tombs, they're not empty. Only the Bible can declare with certainty, he is not here, he is risen, come see the place where the Lord was laid. Yeah. Hallelujah. Only the Bible, only the Christian faith, only Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Now I want you to take your Bibles, go to the book of Acts, the book of Acts. We're going to be in chapter 2 for the next few minutes. And I want to look at a moment in history recorded in the Bible this is several weeks after Jesus rose from the dead. The apostle Peter is here, and he is boldly preaching the gospel in the city of Jerusalem. And he reveals in his sermon three amazing facts about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we're in Acts chapter 2. We're going to read from verse 29 and on. Men and brethren... Let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us today. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, he, David, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus, God, has raised up from the dead, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see in here. Three amazing facts about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. First fact, his appearance to many witnesses. Second fact, his ascension to the right hand of the Father. Third fact, his anointing upon those who will follow him. I want to go through these through the next couple of minutes. The first fact of the resurrection is his appearance to many witnesses. Peter said this, Jesus, God raised up, of which we are witnesses. Peter makes it very clear in no uncertain terms. We have seen Jesus raised from the dead. In fact, in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, it says that Jesus presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them for 40 days. The resurrection is a biblically documented historical fact. Now understand, if the tomb wasn't empty, all his enemies had to do, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, all they had to do was march people over to the tomb and show people the dead body of Jesus that was still there. But they didn't do that. They couldn't do that. And why is that? Because the body of Jesus Christ was not there. 
Jesus had risen from the dead. In fact, in Matthew 28, verse 12, it says how those leaders bribed the Roman soldiers to lie about the empty tomb and tell people that the disciples came and stole the body of Jesus away. For 40 days, he showed himself alive with many infallible proofs. First to the woman at the tomb, then to Peter and the disciples. Then in 1 Corinthians 15, it says to over 500 witnesses at once, then to James, then to all the apostles. Then Paul personally testifies and says that he was seen by me also, Paul said, as by one born out of due time. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a fact. And the apostles dedicated their lives to preaching and proclaiming this fact right up to their dying day. In fact, each of the apostles were tortured horribly because of their faithfulness to preaching this fact. And all of them, except for one, died a horrible, traumatic martyr's death because they refused to deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some were burned alive. Some were boiled alive, hanged, stabbed, crucified, upside down. Now, one might ask, why would these apostles endure such horrible deaths when all they had to do to escape those deaths was deny that Jesus had raised from the dead. Because some say that they lied. Some said that they made up stories. Some say that they were just trying to perpetuate some legend. But the, the apostles, they endured these horrible deaths because they could not deny what they knew to be true, that Jesus had risen from the grave. Hallelujah. And now... We have this testimony with us today that these apostles lived their lives and preached this truth to the day that they died. Now, the question needs to be asked, why was his appearance to the world so important? Because the resurrection proved that what Jesus said was true. And what did Jesus say? Well, among many things, one thing that he said in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Something else he said in John chapter 3, he said, he who believes in me is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in me. Now, let's be clear about this. Jesus made this statement in no uncertain terms. He said, the only way to God is through him. The only way. Now, you might say, wait a minute, how can Jesus say that? How can you make such a bold, a bold claim? What about all these other religions? What about Buddhism? And what about Islam and, and Hinduism and, and Mormonism? Aren't, aren't these all just different paths leading up the same mountain? And this is what many in our modern culture of religious pluralism will say. Study all the religions of the world. This is basically what they say, that God is up there and man is down here. And, and there's, a, there's a distance, there's a separation between God and man. And man must climb his way to God. That man must somehow earn acceptance with God by following rules and rituals and, and religious observances. Islam has its five pillars. Buddhism has the eightfold path. Hinduism has its shrines and its idols. And it's all about good works and, and trying to work our way and earn our way back to God. But I want us to understand something. When Jesus came and lived and died and rose from the dead, he did not just become another way to God with more rules and religious regulations. Jesus is the way to God that opens heaven to us. Hallelujah. And this is what the second fact of the resurrection is all about. And we see it in the ascension of Jesus Christ to the Father. So back to the text, verse 33. It says, after, being raised, after raising him from the dead, he was exalted to the right hand of God. After Jesus resurrected, he ascended 
to the Father. Now, let me explain why this is so important to you and me. There is a problem that we all have, and that problem is called sin. We are all sinners. Romans 3.23 says there's none righteous, no, not one. We have all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. We are born into sin. It is our nature to sin. It's something that many of us do every day in word, thought, and deed. We, we are sinners. And this is bad news for us. This is a problem for us because God, who is perfect and holy, cannot accept sin into his presence. It means that because we're sinners, heaven has been closed to us. In fact, Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Because God is holy, he must separate from sinful man. And more than that, because he's holy and because he's a perfect judge, he must punish sin. He must punish our sin and us for our sins. In fact, Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. That's the bad news. How many want some good news? The good news is that God is love. Yes, he's holy. Yes, he is a just judge, but he is also a loving creator. And God in his love does not want separation from his creations. He does not want to punish us for our sin. And this is what the cross is all about. Everybody say cross. This is what the cross is all about. Now, I know many of us, we like to wear the cross as a, as a piece of jewelry, but understand something in the first century... The cross was not a piece of jewelry. The cross was a form of execution. It was a form of, of humiliating punishment. And when Jesus went to the cross, he was being punished for sin. Not for his sin. He was perfect, sinless. He was being punished for our sin. 1 Corinthians 5.21 says this, For he, God the Father, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, what does that mean? It means that on the cross, he, Father God, made him, Jesus, sin. Now, what does that mean? He made Jesus to be sin. Jesus was made to be sin in the sense that God treated Jesus as if he had committed every sin that has ever been committed, though in fact he had never committed any of them. That's how God treated Jesus on the cross. Hanging on the cross, Jesus was holy and harmless and undefiled. Hanging on the cross, he was never, not even for a split second, a sinner. He was perfect and innocent. But God the Father is treating him as though he had lived my life and committed all of my sins. The crown of thorns on his head. The nails driven into his hands and his feet. That spear thrust into his side. It was God punishing Jesus for my sin and yours. Isaiah 53 verse 6 says that the Lord, God the Father, laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. The sin of mankind was put upon Jesus on the cross and he died the death that we should have died. But what happened on the cross is not the end. After Jesus resurrected, the Bible says he ascended to the Father. In fact, Hebrews 9.24 says that he entered into heaven, into the presence of God the Father as the Lamb of God, sacrificed for the sins of humanity, and he offered his blood as payment for our redemption. Hebrews 9.12 says this, Not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all and obtained eternal redemption. Hallelujah. In Christ, we are redeemed from our sin, bought back to God through the price of the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And this is why 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that we become the righteousness of God in him. When his blood is applied to us, 
the innocence of his life, the righteousness of his life. Leviticus says the life of the flesh is in the blood. So the life of Jesus, his righteousness, his innocence covers us. It is applied to us. It's appropriated to us. So when God looks at us, he sees not our sin that was paid for on the cross. He sees the righteousness of Christ on us. Isn't that good news? This is the gospel. Gospel means good news. It means that we can have complete forgiveness for our sins. He takes our sin and we receive his righteousness. Hallelujah. Amen. Only Jesus did this. I want us to understand that. Only Jesus went to the cross and paid for the sin of mankind. Buddha never went to a cross. Muhammad never went to a cross. Not one of those 330 million Hindu gods ever went to a cross. Only Jesus went to the cross for the sins of mankind. And Acts 4.12 says there is salvation in no other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Only Jesus. And that's why he said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Only Jesus can make you right with God. Can you say right with God? You know, there is no greater knowledge than to know that you are right with God. There are a lot of people today walking around who don't have the assurance that they are in right standing with God. You ask them, are you going to go to heaven when you die? They say, well, I don't know. I hope so. I think I might. I'm trying to be a good person, but I, you know, can we, can we ever really know? Yes, you can absolutely know. 1 John 5.13 says, these things were written that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know that you have eternal life. Amen. And there's no greater knowledge than knowing that you're right with God and you have eternal life. Being right with God means that heaven is open to you, that you have access, access, that whatever you go through in this life, you have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus Christ, God the Son, that you have access. You can come boldly to the throne to obtain help. That God will never leave you. God will never forsake you, no matter what you go through. Now, it doesn't mean you won't have problems. We're all going to have problems, amen? We're all living in broken, decaying bodies. We're going to have problems in this broken, decaying world, right? But it means that when you go through the problems and the challenges of this life, that you have grace and mercy to help in your time of need. Why? Because heaven has been opened to you through the blood of Jesus, and you have appropriated the blood of Jesus to your life by faith. Amen. This is what Christ, exalted to the right hand of God, means. You now have access to the grace and mercy of God in your time of need. Amen. Access. Everybody say access. And that brings me to the final fact of the resurrection that Peter talked about, his anointing on those who follow him. What does that mean? That means the Holy Spirit is now available to you. Look at verse 33. Being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. I like what the prophet Joel prophesied. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. We got any old men here today? No old men. All young men. All right, good. Your young men shall see visions. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. What days? These days. These days where Jesus died and rose from the dead, entered into the presence of the Father, and now pours out his spirit upon all who will follow him. Amen. Now listen, I'm grateful for the healing of God when my body is sick. I'm grateful for the provision of God when my family is in need. But the greatest blessing that God can give to our lives is the power and the presence of God through the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen. This is what we were created for. 
to have connection, to have relationship with God through the person of the Holy Spirit. Amen? John 14, Jesus said this, I will pray to the Father and he will give you another helper. In other words, Jesus is saying, I got to go away. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to resurrect. I'm going to be seated at the right hand of the Father, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. He says, I'm going to pray to the Father, and he will send you another helper that he may abide with you forever. He dwells with you and will be in you. Hallelujah. I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you alone. I will be with you. And listen, there is nothing like the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Nothing like that at all. To know that God wants to help you. If you're a parent, God wants to help you. How many parents said, thank God for that? If you're a parent, God wants to help you. It's true. If you're a teenager, God wants to help you. If you're a married couple, God wants to help you. Whatever your situation in life, God wants to step into your life with mercy and grace to help in your time of need. But there's only one way, and that way is through Jesus Christ. It's by saying yes. It's by accepting the gift that he offers to us. Romans 6.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. It's a gift. He wants you to receive the gift of his forgiveness, his cleansing, his presence in your life. But here's the thing, just like any gift, you have to receive that gift. The gift will do you no good, right, unless you take hold of it and you and you, and you take ownership of it, and you unpack it, and you open it up, and you put it on, and you say, this is mine now. You've got to receive the gift that God is offering you. And how is that gift received? Simply by faith. By faith. Amen. Amen. It's so simple. Romans 10 says this, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The gift of God is received by faith. Now, understand, that's the first step in the journey. Then there's the outworking of that righteousness we had received in our conduct and character. It's a journey, a lifelong journey. But the first step is to receive the gift by faith. Everybody say, by faith. By faith. Amen. And this morning... I want to offer you an opportunity to express your faith and to receive the gift that God has for you and to begin that journey of knowing God and walking with Jesus Christ. Let's all stand together. I'm going to ask the worship team to join me up here. Thank you, Father. Father, I want to pray for everyone in this room right now, God, because I know that there are some that They're not right with you. They don't have that assurance, Lord, of connection with you in eternal life. And I pray, Lord, that the power of the Holy Spirit would even now begin to connect and begin to convict and begin to convince that the love of God is real. And I pray, Lord God, that you will give us that faith that we need to embrace the gift of eternal life. Hallelujah. Now, with your heads bowed, your eyes closed, just very personal, very private moment here. If you're here today, you have never, you have never received Jesus Christ into your life. And today you want to express your faith and say, yes, Jesus, come into my life. I want to lead you in a prayer. Right there where you're standing, just to lead you in a prayer to express your faith to the Lord. I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer with me. In fact, I'm going to ask everybody just to repeat this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I admit that I'm a sinner, but I believe Jesus Christ, God the Son, died on the cross for my sin. And I believe that he offers me forgiveness and eternal life. So Father God, in the name of Jesus, I receive the gift of forgiveness and eternal life. Jesus, come into my life, be my Lord be my Savior, and I want to follow you. Thank you, God, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise. Let's thank God for his grace. Hallelujah. Thank you for 
tuning into our service today. We're so thankful that you were able to join us. We pray that you're able to join us in person here on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock and 1045 every Sunday. We also have amazing children's programs here in the building on Sunday mornings for both services as well. Wednesday nights, 7 o'clock here in the building, we've got amazing children's programs. And then Friday nights from 7 to 9 o'clock, we have our youth programs. If you want to keep up to date with everything going on, please check out our social medias as well as follow everything on our website at missionchurch.com. God bless you and we'll see you around.